everybody. Afternoon, I have to congratulate you because you made it to the final session of the graveyard shift. And uh, after last night, that's even <laughs> more of an accomplishment. <laughs> so thank you. You really must be very interested in um, a rise migration. So, so for the next half an hour, my aim is to really tell you the reality. It's not a sales pitch. It's to tell you what really happened in our case to move to rise. So that's why I call it the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful. Cue the theme song of the Clint Eastwood movie. Um, a little bit about me. Um, just three words. Architect, creative, coach. So in my context, being an architect is a people's job. It's not a technical job. My role is really to get people in a room with the technical knowledge and having the ability to harness that knowledge, get it out of them, and then put it together in a package that can be implemented in my context. But it's a people's job, first and foremost, for me, in my context. Hence, all the hands on the tree to say, that's how we architect. We architect in groups. Creative, yes. Over weekends and on evenings, you will find me somewhere on a stage or in a recording studio with an electric guitar, busy laying down some vibes, right? And that keeps me sane, okay? And then lastly, coach. I have a passion to get the best out of people and to get people to perform at their absolute best. That is my passion. And you do that by changing the way people think and helping them to choose the right perspective. Hence, the looking glass. Enough about me. Let's talk about why you're here. So first, I want to give you context. Context of the project, where we started from, and what did we do. Secondly, the good. In my world, that's the things that really worked well. Then we'll talk about the bad, the things that frustrated us. Because every project is not only good or not only bad, it's always a combination of the two. Then we'll talk about the ugly, the things that really caught me off guard that I did not see coming. And then the beautiful, that sigh of relief right at the end to say, we've done it. And lastly, I want to share a bit of our experience with RISE after the migration. It's in a productive state. How are we managing it within the RISE delivery model? Okay, so let's start context of the actual project. So we were already on S4 HANA, okay? So we didn't do an ERP or an ECC conversion to S4 HANA. This was simply a lift and shift. It should be easy, right? On theory, it should be very easy, and we're going to get to that. Uh, we went to AWS private cloud, okay? Not public. Also a very important distinction. And we migrated from an NTT data center where we hosted our SAP infrastructure. So what did we host? Well, we had our ERP system, uh, Dev QA production with a sandbox. And then we have a separate Fiori landscape. It's not embedded. We run in hub formation. Also, development QA production landscape and then Solution Manager, Development and Production. Then there was a second phase of the project, which was the uh, migration of our open text um, infrastructure. So open text archive, Dev QA production, and then also the OCR services uh, for specifically Vim. Then they either bundle it with BobJ, or you bundle it with SAC, SAP Analytics in the Cloud. So we converted the licensing of A4O during the project from Bob J to SAC, and that allowed me to decommission that landscape and save quite a bit on maintenance. So if you're planning on it, just remember that. For the topic for this day, talk, I want to focus on this section. The other one is a, that that's a topic all on its own, and I can talk an hour just on the open text migration. But I want to focus on that part, S4, Fiori, and Solution Manager. And we used SAP and NTT as the partners for the migration. So 
what did we have to do, the customer, versus what did our partners have to do? Okay. The first thing I want to say is if you move to Rise, do not fire your basis team just yet. Please. Okay. <laughs> so if you think you're going to save massive headcount in the basis world, just wait a bit, right? Just see it through, just settle down, and then you start making decisions. Because what did we have to do? Firstly, you, what you have to do is you have to figure out the new Rise license model. It works differently. It's exactly the same thing, right? You lift and shift it. Now it's licensed differently. You need to apply the new license models to the way you use your system and then calculate how you're going to end up. Okay? Don't be caught off guard by that one. We had to do it. Then we had to agree with SAP what our new architecture would look like in AWS. Okay. An extremely important topic. Why? Cost. Cost. Cloud will be <laughs> eye-wateringly eye expensive if you get this wrong. So spend time on your architecture, have a look at it, and be very clear on what SAP will deploy for you. Connectivity to the AWS RISE tenant. Yes, SAP is not going to put con connectivity down for you. You have to do it. So you need to put down the technical skill to connect your on-premise systems and whatever other systems with your new RISE tenant in whatever cloud aggregator you choose. We just went for AWS. Um, your design of interfaces, that was our problem, and it will be your problem. Um, any impact functionally. Now, it's a lift and shift. They shouldn't be. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about it. And then single sign-on. Oh, my word. That's why I'm so gray. I turned gray within six months. Tell me. It was because of single sign-on. I can't. Yeah. Um, so now you'll ask me, well, what did the partners do? Because what's left, right? They did the actual migration. They did the lift and shift. So between NTT and SAP, they actually made all the backups, got all the stuff together, shifted it off into the cloud, deployed it there, got the stuff working, gave the system back to us and said, no, there, it's yours. Okay. So my dad, uh, I phone my dad every Sunday. Every Sunday afternoon, my dad and I have this arrangement. Then we check in. So he told me, but he read an article about the cloud the other day. But the cloud, the data center is, is underground. Why do they call it the cloud? <laughs> so I said to him, Dad, that's one of the things I can't answer you. Um, so, so that's what they did, right? They got it into the cloud for us. So the timelines, what did it look like? So we started in August and September last year. We started with the architecture, where we discussed this with SAP. SAP provides you with an architect, right? And you sit with this person and you, you flesh out the detail. Each system, the sizing of the system, uh, spend your time there. Please spend your time there. And then it took us two months to establish connectivity to the RISE tenant. I'm going to get to why it took us two months. Um, then in October, we started with the migration of our S4 sandbox. Now, it didn't take a month, right? Please. Uh, that also includes all the functional testing that we did post-migration to ensure that we didn't break anything with the migration. But it's the first one, right? So you take your time. Both partners also take their time. They figure they get their stuff sorted out. They get this machine oiled. Then in November to December, we did the migration of our S4 and our Fiori development boxes. Okay. Then we broke for a month. We all know that that's December holidays in South Africa, right? You don't do major projects over that time. We picked it up in the middle of January when we migrated our S4 and our Fiori QA boxes and also our solution manager development and production boxes. Um, then another freeze for a month. Why? It's our financial year end, end of Feb. And for a month, no changes on the system. So we picked it up after the freeze, and then we did a dress rehearsal. So it's a, it's a, it's a mock, not a mock, it's actually a real migration of our production systems. The main point of that one was to verify that the amount of downtime we thought we'd need was, in fact, what we needed. 
And then we did the live migration over a weekend in April. So that's more or less if you want to see what the timelines were like if you're planning something similar. So what worked well? The bullseyes. Okay. Fortunately, both our partners knew their stuff. That I can tell you. They've done it before, right? Between SAP and NTT, they've done this. They had it under control. They could get it out of that data center. They could get it deployed in, in RISE, and they could hand us a system back and say, there it is, this is what you had. I had the privilege to work with one of the most gifted basis resources I've ever worked with in my life from NTT. If you want his name, chat to me afterwards. The guy was absolutely brilliant. We had awesome support from our SAP CDM, right? So CDM, nice term in the rice world, customer delivery manager. Okay. If that person fails in his or her role, you are in deep trouble. Okay. That's the person that really takes care of you from a day-to-day -day perspective. It's not account management. It's your day-to-day -day person and your access into the RISE world. We really had great support from them who helped us to expedite issues. So absolutely no complaints with, with what they gave us. And I can tell you they were minimal functional impact. Not no functional impact, but minimal compared to if you would go from an ERP or ECC to S4HANA. Fortunately, we were already on S4HANA. The frustrations. I call it a clash of project methodology, but it might not be that, okay? It's just a difference between what we define as a good project methodology and what RISE defines as good one. So the moment SAP completed a migration of your system and they give you that system, it goes into business as usual immediately. It's not in project mode anymore. I'm still buffering, right? The problem is, now you start testing, there's a problem on the system. Okay, it needs fixing. I can't phone the project team and say, you gave me a system that's not working. I have to log a call. Okay? And guess what? That call falls under a business as usual SLA. Not a project SLA. A business as usual SLA. So I have teams that we've planned. You are testing for the next two weeks. They sit for a week. Because there's a Business as usual, SLA for this problem is weak. Then we'd say, but it's a project. No, RICE doesn't work like that. We even went up to director level to talk about this. Okay? It's not going to change. You need to learn how to manage it. Okay? Massive frustration for us. The other problem was that handover from one SAP team to another was not that smooth. So the team that does the migration of your sandbox is not necessarily the team that will do the migration of your development box or your QA or your production. So if you have client-specific things, like we did, and they don't hand that over to the next team, guess what? A simple thing like system parameters. You're going to get a system without your system parameters. Okay? You start testing immediately. Mm. Things aren't working. Ah, you need to log a call. Ah, you need to wait a week. Okay. <laughs> okay. So a lot of headbutting because of that. And then there were certain rise limitations in the offering. I mentioned some of it. Um, rise didn't want to host our SFTP server in, or SAP didn't want to host that in the uh, new rise tenant. So we had to make another plan. Fortunately, Capitec has an AWS tenant, so we could deploy it there. No Fiori Sandbox is offered as a service in RISE because they assume you are embedded. So as of today, as I'm standing here, I don't have one, which actually bit me in the last week because I really wanted to do something on a sandbox on the Fiori side, but it's not available. And also, SAP did not provide our preferred DR location as an option. Our primary was offered, but not our DR, which means we had to establish a presence in a brand new data center, which we never planned for and didn't want to, but we had no choice. Okay. But all is not doom and gloom, right? 
we could actually manage all of this at the end of the day. I'm just sharing with you what some of the frustrations were, so you can prepare. And that wasn't even the ugly, right? That was just frustrations and things we had to deal with. The, the ugly, the things that really surprises us, was RISE did not support our preferred connectivity model in AWS. It was not an option. So that forced us to deploy, first design, architect, and deploy a brand new connectivity model that we never before used in AWS. So our internal teams had to sit back and say, well, what connectivity options do RISE support? We had a look at the options. We chose one, and we had to implement and architect that from scratch. Now, if you've ever architected and implemented something in cloud, you will know that the security alone will leave you awake for weeks and weeks on end. We had two months for it. It sounds long. It's not long. Especially it's a bank, right? These guys, okay, risk is everything, right? And that's why it took us two months, just to get connectivity to the rice tenant. SSO. Um, I never in my life thought that SSO can be so complex. I mean, I just want to log in, right? I don't want to put in a username and a password. I mean, how difficult can it be? Extremely difficult. Um, with a rice tenant in AWS, with Capitec in AWS, with Capitec on-prem, it was an absolute minefield, and we eventually got external consulting in to assist us with that topic, actually from SAP. Brilliant. Consultant was brilliant and really pulled it through for us. But that took us a very, very long time to crack that one. Um, then the reality of the RISE support model. So if you're not in RISE yet and you have your own basis team, it's fantastic, right? You walk over to basis and say, yes, it fix it. Okay, and RISE doesn't work like that. You need to log a call. Okay? That is not the problem. The problem is you need to learn how to log the call and which call you need to log. Okay. I'll give you an example, something like a load balancer, right? So I want them to restart a, re a load balancer, right? That's a service request, and you need to find the load balancer service request, because there are templates. You search for load balancer, it comes a list. <laughs> I've got no idea which one I need to log. It's like, then I log one, no, it's wrong. You need to use another one. Which one? Silence. Okay. That, that, was, a, that was a pain. But that's where that client delivery manager comes in. And that person was such an incredible help for us. That person would immediately come and say, let us help you. This is what you want to do. That's how you log the call. This is how you find it. And that really made things a lot better. Okay. But that caught us of God. Last thing I want to chat about is complexity of charm. If you run charm, which I hope you do, I'm a huge advocate for charm. Um, Charm extend, extended our development freeze periods quite a bit. And we didn't see that coming. Why? So as I mentioned, first we migrated our S4 development system from on-prem to cloud. Guess what? Your transport routes has to be reconfigured because you have a new development system. Okay. Brand new development system, right? So it has to transport now from that development in the cloud to your QA on-prem and your production on-prem. Sounds simple. It's not simple. Because you've got cloud, because you've got different connectivity models, because you've got <laughs> SSO, <laughs> and a lot of other things. We had quite a few challenges with client triple zeros, users, passwords. It was quite a thing. It took us four weeks to get this sorted out. Four weeks. So we agreed with our uh, business community, we will uh, go into a config freeze of two weeks. It ended up being four weeks. I still have the knife marks on my back because of the extra two weeks, believe me. But eventually, we got it right. So it became even more complex when we moved our S4 QA system and also Fiori, which I'm not showing here, to cloud, and at the same time, we also migrated Solution Manager to the cloud. <laughs> so now it's once again new, you have to reconfigure your transport routes. Okay? So you can transport from dev to QA in 
in RISE and then transport, transport back to your S4 system on-prem. Okay, but we learned something, right? It took us two weeks to get that right. Okay, so we halved the effort. But it was awesome. On the go-live weekend, when we had to move this transport route from our QA system to our new S4 migrated system, it took us three hours during the go-live or the, the production migration weekend. But make a note of it if you plan on doing this project. Okay. The beautiful. It reminds me of the stage last night, if you were in front of it. <laughs> um, before I get there, I want to show you what the go-live weekend looked like. This is very, very high level. The detailed one was a task list of 152 items that had to happen across seven teams in the bank and also across our two partners. So on the Thursday evening, we negotiated three days of downtime with business, which started the Friday morning at 10. But the Thursday evening, we already had to cut over certain interfaces that's crucial to business. They actually invoked, it, invoked their business continuity plan as if SAP is down, which was a great test, by the way, for them also. But it's a key interface that we use with third parties to manage our ATM devices, not something you tamper with. So we, we cut over them onto a different system. And then the Friday, these are the times when the activity started. So at 10, we started, uh, we made the system unavailable for business. We had a few pre-migration checks on the Capitec side. And at 11 o'clock the morning, exactly at 11, we handed it over to NTT. And from that moment onwards, the system was unavailable for everyone in Capitec, even the technical teams. Then there's a lot of to and fro. I'm not going to go into the details between NTT and SAP. But at the evening at half past 11, on the Friday, NTT was done. Everything was in AWS. Backups were restored on all the systems and all the servers, and SAP started with their post-migration activities. At 12 o'clock afternoon, noon, on the Saturday, SAP handed the systems over to us. Done and dusted, right? We went onto the systems, everything looked hunky-dory, and then there was a connection issue. For some reason, our web dispatcher could not connect to the S4 backend which is something that didn't happen in dev, it also didn't happen in QA. It happened in production. So it took the RISE team from 12 o'clock till 11 o'clock at that Saturday evening to fix it. But when eventually they fixed that, we went on into the system and everything was fine because we, we fixed and we learned our lessons from the dev and the QA migrations. So. Technically, we could, the Saturday evening at 11 o'clock, we could get all business users. We could have opened the system up and people could have started using it. But we were a bit more conservative because we had three days, right? So on the Sunday, we arranged for business users, key users, to log onto the system and perform key tasks. You know, a simple thing like release a purchase order or take an invoice, run it through the open text VIM process, things like that, or a branch. Log on and just tell me, can you access it? Can you open Fiori? Can you actually work on Fiori? Things like that. And everything came back positive. And on the Sunday afternoon at 4, we cut over that nifty interface of the Thursday evening. We cut them back over to SAP. Ach, to, um, yeah, from the other system back to SAP. So that actually system technically available for business could have been 3 o'clock on the Saturday afternoon, because that was when we, from a Capitec perspective, were done with our post-migration activities, and we felt comfortable to, key to hand it over to business. Okay, the, so the first day, Monday morning, all my users are climbing on a system. Okay, that's stress, right? Okay, it was quiet. It was beautiful. It was the most beautiful quietness I've ever heard. In my, in my whole life. <laughs> I can't stress enough how beautiful it was. Um, issues. Yeah, 
but you won't believe stuff that in my wildest dreams I could not think up. I could not make this stuff up. Like all of a sudden we had a short dump on ST22 on PO release. We found the users. We said, are you getting issues when you release POs? No. Are POs being emailed? Yes. Why are we getting a short dump? We don't know. Okay. We, we fixed it the same day, okay? but it was weird. I don't know. We, use, we customized our PO release app on Fiori. All of a sudden, the standard Fiori app was available for everyone and not the customized one. It's like, can I phone a friend? Can somebody tell me? <laughs> okay. We could fix it the same day, right? <laughs> Interesting. Plant maintenance emails didn't go out. All the other emails went out. Like, what's the story with that? All of a sudden. Until we realized, but it's configured completely differently in PM. Completely differently. It doesn't work like any of the other emails. Okay. We didn't know it. We learned it. It worked in QA. For some reason in production, it didn't work. But fortunately, by the end of day one, all of it was sorted. And that was it. Migration done. So since we migrated, which was on the 23rd of April, what's our experience? We were worried. I'm honest with you, we were worried. Because we thought exactly the same experience that we had during the project, we're going to have post-project, once we're live. I'm happy to say that we didn't. Glad to say. It's still very early days, right? But the response we're getting from support are quick. They're on our stuff. If there's an issue, they are really on it. We get quick response. And there are two roles that I want to really highlight here. The one I don't have on here, but I, I realize I actually have to tell you about it. It's the CDM, right? Your customer delivery manager. Then there's a second role. It's, the, it's your TDM, your technical delivery manager. Okay. Now that role is gold. It's gold. Okay. Because if that role fails, then you're on that, you have to wait five days for somebody just to answer you. But that's the person that understands exactly what needs to be done to solve your problem on a technical level, and they know exactly who in the RISE organization will do it. So that technical delivery manager is the person who's got the line to the right people and the right teams and can really help connect you with the right people in, in RISE very quickly. I'm fortunate that my CDM and my technical delivery manager are two extremely, in, extremely competent people. And they are really on our problems quickly, and we get things sorted out in a time that's acceptable to us. It's still not as quick as having your own basis team. Let's be honest. But for us at the moment, it is manageable. And then our account management also, um, our account manager, uh, very good support. We cannot, cannot complain about the support that we get uh, from there. So where we stand now, okay, we are quite happy. We find it's something we can manage in real time. But one thing, you have to plan further in advance. I cannot just tell them, listen guys, I have the following projects. I need the following things done this week. It's not going to work. You really need to plan longer in advance. Which is by no means a bad thing, right? But the nice thing about it is once, once you've done your planning and you've put it in, you put your stuff in and you've agreed your timelines, then you don't have to worry. Stuff Stuff gets done at the end of the day. Okay. Early days, but um, we're okay. And that's my story. That was our, our experience. Any questions? On this? Oof. That didn't take long, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> There we go. Um, what was the key business driver for opting to go with RISE? 
And secondly, apart from the planning, which you've mentioned now, if you knew then what you know now, what would be the key thing you would do differently? Okay. In terms of the reason why we did it, the data center where we hosted our SAP infrastructure, um, NTT data center, they gave us notice that they are going to decommission the entire data center. Uh, well in advance, right? I mean, it's not as if they told us, listen, you've got a month. <laughs> so they actually notified us two years in advance. So we then had to decide, are we going to move to another data center on-prem and eventually go rise? Because we all knew we were going to do it eventually anyway. And we decided, no, we're not in the mood for two hops. We'd rather bite the bullet and get it done. Also, commercially, it was quite a benefit for us. And let me explain that. So we were under a HEC contract anyway, but it didn't work exactly like most HEC contracts. So at the time that contract was signed, many, many years ago, there was a, a, a quite a limitation on, on where a bank can specifically host data. Although at that stage we wanted to go cloud, there wasn't a, a cloud aggregator yet on South African soil. That changed since. I mean, now we're almost spoiled for choice, right? So that made it possible to ask your questions. Why did we go that route? What would I do different? Um, I would definitely skill up myself on AWS a lot more. <laughs> um, and maybe a comment to everybody here is, you, if you move SAP to the cloud, you really need to know your cloud platform. Okay. If it's AWS, get to know AWS and get to know it very well. If it's Azure, get to know Azure very, very well. You will not get by simply by knowing SAP. Okay. That for me is the one thing I would say from a technical perspective. Yeah. Skill up. Okay. No, thanks. Um, I think the first one was a business driver, so you have addressed that. The second one for me, the, in terms of the turnaround times, right, uh, between, oh, maybe in two parts, one is the turnaround time between where you were with your internal team to now with uh, SAP from a support point of view, your comment on that. And secondly, the, the, the cost model prior to going, um, I know you were in HEC, prior and after, uh, your comment also on that. Okay, in terms of the cost model, um, it worked out in our favor, um, but we have a very efficient procurement department. <laughs> and <laughs> Lee, our account manager, is here, and she knows how they can squeeze anybody. Um, so it was really, it was the art of negotiation, but SAP also came to the party. And that's why it actually worked out for us. Uh, I would not say significantly cheaper, but definitely a lot cheaper. So it's also not a little bit. It's not like half. But it, is, it definitely made a, quite a difference in making the actual decision. But it did work us out quite a bit cheaper. If we had the entire landscape on-prem and we managed it ourselves with a massive basis team, it may have worked out differently. Because believe me, cloud is expensive, right? I'm always amazed when I see any vendor putting an article out there to say, talk to us about cloud. We will save you 20% immediately. I'm like, I lose all my respect for that vendor and that supplier immediately. Because making a blanket statement like that without knowing what my organization looks like Oof. I don't know if I can believe anything you tell me after that. So, yeah. um, for somebody to come in and do a costing, they really need to understand your entire landscape, how you're managing it, how many people you have, how many suppliers or service providers you use. It, it, it's a very complex one. But ours wasn't as complex. So I can tell you, definitely, it worked us out cheaper. Okay. Um, the other one, in terms of the turnaround time, um, I think it is slightly, takes slightly longer, uh, definitely. 
um, because engaging all of a sudden now with RISE, it's a much bigger organization. Okay. The bigger it gets, the slower it moves because it's just more complex. But I, uh, at the moment where we are now, by just planning better and planning longer in advance, we can manage it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs>